Hey, everybody, it's the Plant Based Business Hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Great to have you with me. In 2023, if you are listening via podcast, this is the second podcast you're getting of 2023. But if you are live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube, thanks for being with me at the beginning of the year. And we made it through 2022, which often felt like being repeatedly punched in the face. So I'm really happy that's over. And I'm looking forward to smooth sailing in 2023. I don't kid myself. The year's going to start out tricky, no doubt. Uh, we have lots of healing to do from 2022. Oh, and by the way, 2020 and 2021. But I do see greener pastures ahead, and they are green, which is why as we start January, otherwise known as Veganuary. That's right. About 629,000 people signed up for Veganuary. That's the act of giving up meat and dairy in the month of January as part of a long-term, hopefully, New Year's resolution, or at least for the month of January, or at least a couple of days in January, however you roll. Uh, 629,000 signed up last year, according to Veganuary. So who knows what 2023 will hold. But when I think of diet change, I also think of climate change. And so as I get my finances in shape, and as I get my weight in shape, shape, I get my carbon footprint in shape. So today for the first episode of the Plant-Based Business Hour in 2023, I want to talk about getting in climate shape for your business and for you, which is why I'm going to bring on my guest today, Katie Contrell, the CEO of Greener by Default, and Anna Bobot, who is the manager of global food and beverage for LinkedIn. Thank you both for being with me. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. So happy new year, everybody. Let's get into it. The reason I wanted the two of you on the show today is because I think in 2022, you were up to some super cool pilot stuff. So I'll just set the uh, level set for everyone, and then we can dive into the details. Greener by default helps companies have a better carbon footprint, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by taking their company cafeteria, maybe it's a university cafeteria, by taking their large commercial feeding organization, if that's oh, an expression, which it really isn't, uh, plant-based, or at least in part plant-based, because those climate numbers look better. So as many organizations have tried to address their climate goals for 2030, but maybe haven't even started, by 2023. Uh, here's a simple, easy way to do that. And they tried out this pilot program with LinkedIn. So with that, I'll throw it to you, um, Katie, and then also Anna, just chime in as you see fit. Why did LinkedIn, well, I'll start with Anna, I guess. Why did LinkedIn decide to work with Greener by default and try this pilot program of taking your cafeteria, at least in part, plant-based? Yeah, so we were approached by Katie and her team at Greener by Default and were immediately excited to use menuing and behavioral studies to our advantage to try to change the way we were menuing in our food service um, in our corporate dining areas, uh, which we call our cafes. And the whole idea was to make it easier for our employees to choose more plant-based options. So we weren't taking away meat. We were just making it easier to choose more of a variety of plant-based options, which in reality, we did reduce the amount of animal protein offered, but there was still plenty of variety and our employees never missed them. They were extremely happy. Um, it was, uh, you know, Katie's team worked very closely with our chefs to review our menus in, in advance and gave them feedback and kind of coached them along the way. Um, and we decided to roll it out in a slow phased approach just so it wouldn't feel like ripping off a bandaid or like sudden changes. It was a, a slow collaborative approach, which was very successful for us. Um, and we did choose to do it in one location to start, uh, just to see how it went and take our lessons learned and our best practices to be able to apply if it was successful after three months uh, and if we wanted to expand. Mm -hmm. So really fascinating. Just a little bit of background before we get into some of the great numbers that I think you both have to share. Was this a LinkedIn idea and you reached out to Greener by default? So LinkedIn was thinking we need better climate numbers or did Greener by default reach out to you? Great question. Uh, we had already implemented a requirement for our food service vendors to uh, have a plant-based station in all of our cafes globally. And for smaller locations that did not have dedicated stations, there was a requirement to have plant-based options every day. So we had the framework already in place, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, it wasn't strong enough. It wasn't 
educational enough. It wasn't, I, I would say it wasn't as well thought out and we totally could have done better with uh, tying it into carbon. And so it was perfect mm -hmm. timing when Katie had reached out and she shared about their work. And I said, oh my gosh, this is what we need. We need, you know, we need that structured support. We need the scientific approach. We need behavioral studies to point back to, and we're just going to go big and make this our standard across the board. Mm -hmm. I think this is such a cool perspective and talking about education. It's great that you realized it. LinkedIn realized it early on that education, you wanted that to be a component. Katie, maybe you can dive into some of the details. Like if LinkedIn was already sort of plant-based before, what did their percentage of plant-based to meat look like prior? And then maybe you can uh, map out for us what the program you brought to them really entailed. Absolutely. So greener by default is sort of a next step for companies like LinkedIn that are already mm. forward thinking, but it's also really a paradigm shift because often what we see is there'll be a plant-based or plant forward station. And it's this idea that we have vegetarian and vegan options for the employees who are vegetarian and vegan. And so mm -hmm. you get like a vegan option or a vegan station and then the normal meat stations. And what happens with mm -hmm. this, there's all of these studies showing that with human psychology, that really splits people. So you get the veg people go to that station, everyone else, all the omnivores go to the normal meat stations. And so what our program is really focused on is not more vegan options for the vegans, it's really encouraging flexitarianism. This idea that we want omnivores to eat more plant-based foods more often. Not that you know they have to be totally vegetarian or vegan, but just making it easier, more mm -hmm. appealing, more socially acceptable for omnivores to choose plant-based options. And so we really came in with that lens and saw that you know, at the time there were three stations that always had veg options and there were five stations, excuse me, three stations that always had veg entrees. All of the stations had a lot of delicious veg side dishes, but we look specifically at entrees um, to get at this idea that is this a complete meal? Because also many people have this concept that it's not a real meal. I'm not going to be full unless there's meat. So we want to make sure that there's, you know, a really appealing, full, uh, nutritionally adequate meal based on plant-based protein. So when we came in, there were three veg stations and five meat stations, essentially. And so we said, okay, let's very gradually over the course of three months, flip that ratio. There have been several studies that have shown that uh -huh. when you just have one veg option and say three meat options, that about 10% of people will choose a veg option. But if you have three veg options and one meat option, about half of people will choose a veg option. So, you know, again, getting outside of this idea of, oh, that's the one veg option for the vegetarians and instead making it about the flavors and the dishes and what am I in the mood for? What sounds good to me today? So we made sure that the five stations that had previously always had meat entrees, it was the same type of food. So the comfort food station, just every now and again, instead of having a meat-based comfort dish would have a plant-based comfort food dish or, you know, the Asian inspired station would have a tofu based dish instead of a beef based dish. So we did this very gradually over the course of several months. We started slowly incorporating more veg entrees into the stations that previously had only had meat based entrees until eventually we had it totally flipped. So there would be five veg entrees and three meat entrees every day. And if I'm understanding correctly, these would all be housed, for lack of a better expression, in the same area. So it's not like the veg is over here to the right and Okay, so they're they're living together in harmony. Okay, and did you have any of the employees say, well, wait a minute, before I would count and there would be five meat dishes and now there are only three? We didn't have that. And you know, <laughs> there's a fine line to walk between not drawing people's attention to something unnecessarily. So a lot of the behavioral science research that we're implementing has to do with perception of food. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's studies showing that if you call it a vegetarian wrap, people are much less likely to choose it than if you call it a roasted red pepper avocado hummus wrap. If you focus on the flavors and the ingredients and the provenance rather than, oh, this is vegetarian or vegan, people are more likely to choose it. You know, partly because there are negative stereotypes still about vegetarian and vegan food, but also just this idea that it's more about people's identity, that if I'm not a vegetarian, that food is not for me. And a great analogy for that is celiacs. If you were to see a celiac bowl on a menu, you probably wouldn't think to order that unless you have celiacs or you're gluten-free. But if you see a Thai peanut rice noodle bowl, then if those flavors sound good to you, you're choosing that. You're not even thinking about the fact that it has gluten or not. So, you know, we didn't want to unnecessarily draw people's attention to the fact that there were more vegetarian items. But at the same time, we don't want to mislead them 
or make them feel like, you know, they're not getting all of the information we need. So, you know, the first early phases when we started just adding a veg dish here and there, I mean, most cafes don't advertise. We're serving five meat entrees instead of four meat entrees today. I don't think diners expect like that level of granularity in the communication. Um, but by the time we got to the bigger changes where we were really getting to like flipping the ratios, uh, happily it coincided with Earth Month. And so that gave us a really natural opening to communicate that in honor of Earth Month to make it easier to make more sustainable food choices, we're offering a wider array of plant-based protein. So then we did a, an educational presentation. We had infographics, all that information. Yeah, so it was not proactively communicated when we started. It was that slow rollout and data gathering. And we did, um, Katie worked with the onsite team to do a survey for customer satisfaction in January when we first started. So we would have a baseline. And then we did a survey in um, April, right? Right before uh, April started to get the after and uh, customer satisfaction did not go down. It stayed the same pretty much. <laughs> and then there were a, a couple of comments that came through on our customer satisfaction survey that um, they acknowledged the uh, amount of vegetarian options and they were loving it. There were no negative comments. It was pretty awesome. Yeah. So this is amazing to me. Let's dive in a little bit more about the education component. So when people, as you say, they didn't go for the vegan entree per se, they went for the Thai spicy peanut dish. And were they interested in the carbon numbers? Was that, did you get any feedback on, and if they were liking the fact that they could tie climate change to food? So we didn't do carbon labeling on the, mm. um, on each dish. There's mixed research on that. Um, it depends on how it's conveyed, but if you do, studies have shown that if you show numbers, people are often confused because they don't have a good grasp of like, 30 kilograms versus 50 kilograms. What does that mean? What should my daily totals be? Yeah. That can be confusing to people. And then if you do like a red, yellow, green stoplight, that's mm -hmm. easier to understand, but it can also be seen as kind of offensive or like patronizing of like, don't tell me what to eat or don't shame me for my choices. And that's a big part of Greener by Default is preserving people's freedom of choice. So this is not entirely plant-based. Um, we have often seen backlash to fully meatless menus because, you know, adults like to be able to make their own choices and not feel like they're having it forced onto them. So as Anna said, you know, there's still three meat entrees every day. So there's, that's plenty of variety for people to choose from. You know, most omnivores aren't gonna be stifled if they're having to decide between three different choices. So we didn't do that level of labeling, um, but it was more in communicating the success of the program and saying that, hey, collectively, you know, all of our choices together, we're able to save this amount of carbon. Um, yeah. The other component of it that we haven't talked about yet is we also did an oat milk default in their coffee bar. Um, so, you know, like most places it used to be, if you go up and order a latte and don't specify, it's just assumed that you want dairy milk. So now it's the reverse um, that for a while the baristas would say, is oat milk okay with that? And we did have signage up in the coffee bar saying that, you know, if you choose oat milk in your latte, you save enough water for two showers. So those those little facts that really converted into comprehensible data that make people excited and, you know, oh, that, you know, I can understand what that means and that's a real impact. So I'm just bringing up a visual to kind of help underscore what you're talking about. So I think you were saying usually the, the baseline for dairy milk is that most cafeterias or corporate, be they corporate or university, have about 71% of dairy milk. Am I reading this right? This is um, San Francisco specifically. Oh, this is for LinkedIn, San Francisco specifically. Yes. Okay, great. Um, and they had about 20% of oat milk. And then of course there's almond milks and other kinds of milks. But then when you tried the pilot program, you switched it to over time, 55% oat milk and 18% dairy milk. And um, you have a great slide. Let's see if I can find it here of showing kind of what that looks like. So here we can see, so sorry for the audio people on iTunes, uh, but we're seeing this great graph that, um, by April, after having switched over slowly to more oat milk, you see cutting carbon by 50%. Am I reading this right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Cutting yeah. carbon by 50%. Please go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, the, the carbon footprint of milk served was cut by 50% as a result of that huge increase in oat milk. And I'll just a personal side note. I love soy milk. <laughs> Am I the only one? It's not on your graph. 
<laughs> it's uh it's it's not as in right now as oat milk i would say <laughs> well fair enough yeah one could ever be as popular as oat milk yeah that's <laughs> such a positive one um well that's great you know since we're on your slide deck i'd like to go through a couple of other slides i'm kind of taking us back a step but you know linkedin seemed very progressive and already wanting to do a little bit better i mean in my perspective already having a plant-based station even though it was its own separate station is is pretty progressive. Um, but there's a great slide that you have here in the beginning of a presentation. This was a wrap up presentation that you did, Katie, for the Verge conference where we met last in, in Santa Cruz, I think it was, uh, last fall. So you presented, and this is a slide from your presentation, showing how if you switch over, what would be the most effective way to cut your carbon footprint? And you have the option of reducing people's portion sizes, which I think they noticed more. They noticed this is just a subjective opinion. I think they noticed that more than they noticed there are more um, vegetarian entrees. Um, but there's that option, which reduces the carbon footprint a little bit. We can see from the graph, or there's going zero waste, 100% recycled plastic that really does nothing, and then zero waste, eliminating single plastic use that does a little bit. But to really get the bang for your buck, so again, if you're a corporation looking to reduce your carbon footprint, particularly with 2023 loom, excuse me, 2030 looming, you see that the real big win is moving beef to veggie. Am I reading that right? Yes. Yeah. This was based on a study that was looking at different sustainability interventions that could be done for a hundred person event. And exactly like you said, you know, these, these sustainability interventions that we typically think of like reducing plastic, eliminating it altogether. Um, you know, they're very important for other sustainability and social reasons, but in terms of carbon footprint, the impact is pretty low compared to the impact of changing food. And we see this so often that in green meetings guides, they will talk about how food is served, that you shouldn't use disposables, but they don't talk about what food is served, even though that is by far the biggest bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, I really liked Anna's comment about, you know, we just wanted to bring more options to our employees. We wanted to make this a rich experience. We wanted to bring education. I think just like you were saying, Katie, you know, we try to focus not on the, the person or the identity. I am vegan or I am a meat eater. We try to focus on the food. This is spicy. This isn't. This is fresh. This is cooked. This is baked. This is fried. This is um, chewy and tangy. And this is sweet and sour or what have you. Um, I also like the idea that um, meat eaters have more choices. I think vegan or vegetarian or healthy options are thought about for the vegan giving them an option, but I actually see it as the exact opposite. Many meat eaters are trying to, you know, January, new year, new you, new year's resolution, trying to be healthier, trying to move in the right direction. And I really see this as an option for just a plethora of options for them. I'm wondering, Anna, if you got any of those kind of feedbacks from the employees. Yeah, yeah. And consumer trends in general nationally in the U.S. are, are veering towards people like self-identifying as flexitarians. So it aligns really well with the way consumers and our employees, which are also consumers, are, sure. are going. And um, from a culinary standpoint, too, um, you know, the creative freedom for the chefs never like was an option on the table. Uh, a lot of them were pushed to look into more uh, unique cuisines that they hadn't previously explored. So I, I know our chef in San Francisco, she was pulling out, you know, African cookbooks and Middle Eastern cookbooks and uh, Indian and so, like Southern Indian, Northern Indian. And she was so excited to try to teach her team to create new dishes that they wouldn't normally have tried before. Um, and uh, so from a culinary standpoint, it was it was adventurous. It was educational for the chefs and for the employees as well to be able to see these new cuisines being offered in their cafe space. So, um, yeah, from a variety standpoint, I think it actually pushed the teams to get more creative. And I thought that was a big win. So here are some climate friendly menus and the ratios and how they've they've differed. So we see on the left, the before menu from LinkedIn, I believe this is also from LinkedIn. Katie, tell me if I've got that wrong. 
Yes, no, that's correct. So you have cauliflower quinoa dumplings. Now I would automatically think like, oh, hey, okay, you got something there. That's already like a step in the right direction. But this is before North African spiced for lasso salmon, arroz con pollo y plantano. I'm just plat platano, I'm just butchering that. Meatball pizza, butternut squash Brussels sprout pizza. So already you see that LinkedIn is kind of getting the memo. Fried chicken pakora. Chana dal tadka. Oh my word, I've never had that. Pork stir fry. And then you see the after menu shiitake, coconut, soba noodles, chicken, proper kosh, Ecuadorian fresh corn tamales, truffled telagio and mushroom pizza, classic pepperoni pizza, salmon tandoori, alu gobi, kung pao cauliflower. I would say if I didn't do the map, I wouldn't even notice that there was any different ratio here. Yep, yeah, and that's the goal. <laughs> right. Yes. And that's the goal. Okay. Well, so then, so uh, oh, another point before we leave this, um, how many of the chefs needed education themselves, Anna, or did they just take this as like a Yahoo challenge? This is going to be fun. Our culinary director in San Francisco for Good Eating Company, she was already very forward thinking and took it with open arms. Uh, she did take the plant forward culinary course at the Culinary Institute of America in Napa or in, yeah, I think Napa, uh, not too long ago, I think last year. Um, so it's been top of mind. Our entire team uh, from the South Bay and SF also attended the plant forward summit at the CIA um, where we actually shared about this initiative there. So it's been top of mind for the teams. I think where it gets challenging is, is training, um, the hourly cooks and getting them excited and, but educating them and, and, you know, un explaining why it's important and it's not, no, we're not just making more plant-based options. We're actually going to bring in, you know, uh, more of a variety of things that are better for the environment and better for their for our employees' health. And this is how we're going to make it. And you're going to get to try these cuisines that you've never cooked before. So it's it's a it's definitely a collaborative approach that's educational, not just for the people eating the food, but for those cooking the food as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so cool. You know, one of the things at home is that I think I speak for myself, but maybe also for others. I cook what I know how to make. I'm not pulling out a recipe to do chana, the, the dish that I said I had never tried. I'm making a sandwich, most likely, and I'm moving on. So restaurants and cafeterias is where I look to try the stuff I would never make at home. And that's what I'm willing to pay for. Cafeteria, of course, is free if you you know work at LinkedIn. But if I go out to a restaurant, the same applies for me. That's what I'm paying for is that chef's creativity. So I always think, you know, lately there's been a lot of discussion about, oh, grocery store sales are down for plant-based. That in and of itself is debatable. Uh, it's really that they've moved from the fresh section to the frozen section. But that's another show, a different conversation. But you know, I think a lot of people are just eating more plant-based out because even though it might sound simple to fry a plant-based burger, you still fry it at different temperatures and you fry it for longer or shorter, or there are still differences. And so why take that risk? Just let the professionals do it and eat plant-based out of the house. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that just gives people a lot more options. So I think yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this is that we are in a position to influence behavior mm -hmm. because we're exposing folks to new things that they wouldn't otherwise try at home. And so by making it more abundant and more available, uh, it's an easier choice. They're likely more likely to try more plant-based dishes and then be able to try it at home. Otherwise, I agree with you that I don't think they would try to make that, that risk at home yes. with you know? <laughs> yes, exactly right. Um, and was this more expensive for LinkedIn or how did it factor into the LinkedIn budgeting? Yeah. So, you know, overall, our total animal protein purchasing went down in the cafe. And so less was spent on animal proteins. Labor did not increase. So there's a lot of people sure. that always ask, you know, well, did you spend more on labor since you were having to make, you know, scratch meat patties? And the reality of it is, is that even if you buy animal proteins, those also have to get processed in some way or another. And yeah. so the labor did not increase. Um, the the cost of goods, so the, the food cost for the coffee bar did increase slightly because of the oat milk. Um, we get good stuff. Um, and uh, the cost did go up for that, which... Um, the other thing that went up is packaging waste from the Tetra packs of the oat milk. And so uh -huh. we knew that, and we knew that would happen. We, that was a, um, something that we expected. Uh, and our chef was seeing how many Tetra packs we were going through because not every site in the U S recycles Tetra pack, um, FYI. 
And um, we, the chef was inspired to start making her own oat milk in house. So she ordered a machine and was started making large batches and was sweetening it with dates and, and adding some emulsifiers because it was too thin and not fatty enough for the baristas and the employees, you know, like, so now they're on a mission to make the best oat milk in house. And so it's been a very cool journey to see. You know, when I used to work in Fortune 500 companies, so I worked at the Kellogg Company and I was on Special K and Frosted Mini Wheats. Those were my brands as brand manager. We would have company outings and we would kind of bond and maybe all go to like the newest movie together and we'd like take over the movie theater en masse. Not because we'd rented it out, but because we'd like all go and buy tickets at the same time. And it was really kind of fun. But this sounds to me almost like a corporate employee bonding experience, you know, like you're learning more, you're eating together, you're, you know, it's not like so divided, Republican or Democrat, vegan or not, like eat to the left or eat to the right, but more of this like progression together about our planet and our, our hobby of finding new ways to make food. Did you see any sort of camaraderie come through this? Well, yeah, uh, we are in a weird time with return to work and, and, uh, you know, um, so in a way being able to reopen, number one, we were very mm -hmm. fortunate to reopen number two, to be able to have these services on site, extremely fortunate as well. Um, but being able to do that as a company, we were able to provide the opportunity for employees to reconnect and to collaborate and to break bread again. Mm -hmm. After not having met, maybe some, a lot of folks got hired virtually over COVID. And so, yes, they were able to break bread over all this amazing food and reconnect. And, and uh, we like to call it have casual collisions again in, in these spaces that we create for that. Um, and, and yeah, and creating inclus inclusive areas too. So yes, completely. And, you know, we were talking about costs, but there's also the offset costs and it's more of an intangible, but there's such a positive reward for the company when the employees feel that they work for a place that does good by society and that it's just general way of moving through the world is better. And so I think there's a lot to be said there. Um, but maybe we can also dive into some of the results. So I was kind of amazed. Let me bring back our presentation and see if I can bring up one of the results. Oh my gosh. Um, Katie, I will let you do the honors because this is my favorite slide. Go have it. <laughs> yes. So we were comparing October was baseline before we did any type of intervention. And then April was the full pilot when we had that flipped ratio of meat to veg. And when we compared the two, we found the amount of meat served per person was cut in half. So very dramatic result. I mean, look at that. What we're seeing here for the folks who are listening on iTunes is the October baseline at LinkedIn before they slowly started switching over the ratio of five meat entrees to five vegan entrees, vegetarian entrees, vegan entrees, a little bit of both, um, and, and keeping only three meat entrees. So still three out of eight. Uh, they switched people from 0.49 pounds of meat to 0.22 pounds of meat. So first of all, one thing to note, in the month of October, people were eating about half a pound of meat just at lunch, not their breakfast and their dinner at home. That, that to me is kind of a lot. But um, then we see that they've cut it in half by 0 0.22, 2.22 pounds without really making that much of a difference in the menu. We all saw the menu and it still had like lots of meat options in it. So I think that's surprising. And then from the corporate, so that's the personal win. From the corporate win, um, and you, you see here, let me get to the corporate win first and then I'll come back. The corporate win, it looks like, Katie, am I reading this right? That LinkedIn took down their carbon footprint by 14,000 kilograms CO2. Yes. So we calculated the difference in the amount of meat that would have been served without the pilot versus what was served during the pilot. And that difference in meat served um, is equal to 14,000 kilograms of carbon equivalent. And is, is this a savings in one month or over a three month that's program? One month. Yeah, that's that's April. Oh that's just for the month of April when we had the full implementation. Okay, so in one month, LinkedIn San Francisco was able to pull down its carbon footprint by 14,000 kilograms of CO2, which equals about 35,000 miles of driving. 
Anna, were you happy with that? We were extremely happy with that. <laughs> and, and, you know, as we, with this episode is about being in climate shape, either for the corporation or for the individual, what that means for the individual as they go from 0.49 um, pounds of meat to 0.22 pounds of meat, their carbon footprint goes from 2.2 kilograms of CO2 per person in a month just from lunch to 0.78. So they cut down their personal corporate footprint by 60% when they change their lunch. So this is just the impact of lunch. Yeah, just to clarify, this is this is actually the carbon footprint just from animal protein, specifically. Mm. So Thank we you for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, you know, it would have been a, a massive effort to collect all of the data on every single, you know, type of grain and vegetable and spice and everything used across food service. So we got, you know, to focus on the, the main impact we were tracking animal protein in particular. Yeah. So just to me, amazing results with, if I'm understanding this correctly, I'll say not really too much expense, Anna, not, not like a big load of money or not reconfiguring your kitchen, your corporate kitchen, or not hiring new chefs, nothing really major happened. No, no. And, um, you know, going back to, we did not do climate labeling also because we are not recipe based. Our chefs do not normally follow recipes to be, so to be able to calculate that um, on a individual plate basis would have been extremely challenging and we would have needed some sort, you know, like <laughs> we would have had to spend some kind of money to be able to pull a database together and calculate, um, those emissions and everything. So, uh, that's the reason why we worked with Katie and looked at the animal protein for that calculation. So will you do it in other LinkedIn cafeterias? Yes, we are expanding nationally. Uh, we have been ex already expanding nationally uh, after we saw the success of San Francisco. Uh, the oat milk default started almost immediately at all of our other national locations and the menuing has been in the works. Um, next up is APAC. So we uh, have some uh, some locations in, in uh, APAC where we offer food. So Katie's team is working with them. And our EMEA locations, we have a headquarters in Dublin, Ireland. They're already pretty innovative. So we're just going to do a check-in with that team to see where we stand. And our aim is to have a minimum 65% plant-based requirement for all menus offered. And will it be the same thing where they're blended together in the same eating station and not separated? Yes. No more plant-based station. It will all be an integration. I just love this. Yeah. So ultimately, it just gives people enormous amounts of choice, no labeling, no, I mean, cause there's nudging and then there's anti nudging, you know, and that's when we label things vegan or not vegan or meat or not meat, you're sort of pigeonholing people and not giving them that opportunity to really branch out and be their true selves. So uh, I, I think it's, it's really exciting. Um, Katie, because you work with Greener by default and you don't just work with LinkedIn, do you anticipate other corporations will be doing this? Or, you know, as we are the year 2023 making predictions, how do you see this kind of cafeteria programming impacting corporations around the globe? Yeah, absolutely. We are seeing tremendous interest. So we're we're new and this is a really cutting edge strategy. So last year was basically our first year and we had the, you know, the huge success with the LinkedIn pilot. And then we also worked with New York City Health and Hospitals. We piloted plant-based defaults for all patient lunches in the 11 hospitals in New York City. That was also an overwhelming success. About 60% of eligible patients were choosing the plant-based options. So we're now really trying to leverage these wins and show other corporations, other hospitals, as well as universities that, like you were saying, you know, it's easy, low cost, and it's very effective. So we're seeing a lot of interest. Um, yeah, really from all sectors of food service. Mm -hmm. And I love that you mentioned New York. So Mayor Eric Adams went plant-based himself to reverse diabetes and even the onset of early blindness. And he was able to reverse both of those by switching over to a plant-based diet. And his mother, who was beyond 80, reversed her own diabetes, where at 81, I believe, almost 82, just, just slightly beyond 80, she was able to reverse her own diabetes. That to me is amazing. That's amazing what the diet can do. That's amazing what the body can do um, to make such a change at 80 and still have such great impact. But I think New York is not alone. So as New York goes to, correct me if I'm wrong, plant-based Fridays in schools, as well as maybe meatless Mondays and just plant-based options the whole week and then plant-based default options. So it's plant-based first in hospitals as people are trying 
trying to get better. New York's not alone. Illinois just introduced well, maybe six months ago plant-based options in schools, and now it's mandatory to have them. I think they're still working under old uh, regimes where it's plant-based to the left and other things to the right. So I don't know if it's integrated as fully and comprehensively as your program, Grain or by Default, Katie, but uh, I think I think corporations, government entities, universities, and countries are all looking for ways to have a better impact on the planet, reduce their carbon footprint, and Anna, I'll throw it to you, get credit. So how is LinkedIn using these numbers beyond feeling great themselves and, and being a proud uh, steward of the planet? Are you touting these numbers? Do they end up in a corporate report at the end of the year about how you're meeting certain climate goals? I mean, unfortunately, our food program is not the largest emitter of uh, mm -hmm. carbon emissions in a tech company like ours. So mm -hmm. it's actually a very small blip. <laughs> um, really? Yeah. And so uh, we, as, as our food team, as the food program, we see it as a responsibility just to the company in general to be able to default to these types of initiatives um, just to do the right thing and moving forward. Um, we do collect the data that we, you know, we work with Katie and we're going to be expanding to get better data. Um, oop, oop, where'd it go? My browser just kind of went down. Um, to get more data, to be able to report up, uh, we were acquired by Microsoft about five years ago, I'm not sure. And so we do report these types of impacts um, to them to hopefully, Kind of feature in their reporting um but yeah we you know it's we try to tout it um we remain humble though and we're just doing the right thing yes i love that and i think um it's great for employee retention again it's an intangible but i think um, employees are interested in that kind of company. So as we wrap up uh, this episode, but not the year, we just starting the year. So what are our predictions moving forward in 2023? It can be about anything, but of course, it's probably going to be about this topic right here. Katie, I'll start with you making any predictions for 2023, what we're going to see down the line. Well, I mean, you know, a lot of companies are really starting to focus on scope three with the mm -hmm. draft from the SEC requiring scope three emissions reporting. So I think we're going to see a lot more focus on food and easy, effective strategies for companies to cut their scope three emissions. And is what Anna's saying about LinkedIn true, if you had to grossly overstate for most companies that their cafeteria is a small part of their corporate footprint? Okay. It is. Yeah. I mean, generally speaking, that is true. Um, you know, it depends on the size of the company and the size of the food service. But mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it is an easy thing to change. And it's also, you know, Elizabeth, exactly as you were saying, in terms of employee engagement, it's nice because it's a way that employees can be directly connected to environmental savings, because a lot of the initiatives like installing solar panels yes. or upgrading furnaces or what have you, they're very abstract and they're not something that the average employee interacts with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so food is a way that we can say all of the employees, we all came together and we did this as a team. And so that's another really nice perk of it. Mm -hmm. I think that's so true. I don't think that could be underestimated just how much good feeling comes from doing this uh, for the employees and, and pride. And that ultimately serves the company well. Anna, what are your predictions for 2023? Um, I think that we will continue to see more folks um, be flexitarians. I think that we are finally getting responsible sourcing the attention that it needs. Um, mm. We uh, not just from a carbon standpoint, but from a, you know, animal welfare perspective, because we are still sourcing animal proteins as well. So I'm really excited to be able to focus on that and um, and dig into our scope three emissions in general as well, because we are a global company and we order food from around the world. Um, there's always room for opportunity to do better. And so that'll be 2023 for us. I love it. And I'll start with you, Anna. Uh, what do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? Oh gosh. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> that's a, that's a challenging one. I wasn't ready for this one. That's a No, these, these are meant to be, I should have warned you. Yeah. These are meant to be like off the cuff, <laughs> one word answers, like no thinking. That's the whole, it's meant to be like just a visceral. Cause we're just about to round out the, and, and end the episode. I'll put you on hold for a second. I'll give it to Katie. Katie, okay. what do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? 
um, that you can change people's behaviors directly without trying to change their attitudes. I spent mm -hmm. about a decade talking to people about the evils of factory farming and the importance of food choices. And it's important work, but it's very much an uphill battle. And so I was really just bowled over when I saw the behavioral science research that you know, you don't have to lecture someone or like give them a huge sign. If you just change the name or like put something first on a menu that can have as big of an impact. So that, yeah, that's really like reframed my whole approach to, uh, to food advocacy. And I, I'm still um, giving Anna some time. So I'll just yeah, say yeah. <laughs> that's something that we didn't even talk about is where the food is placed. So not just how it's labeled or how it's included, but is it easy access or is it way hard behind or up on a shelf or just amazing making it the default easy access option sometimes is, is all it takes. Okay, Anna, what do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? Yeah, um, you know, keep pushing like Katie's saying, and um, as an individual, you can make a difference um, mm -hmm. because there are people, there are human beings running sourcing. There are human beings, you know, running culinary programs and dining programs and those individuals can make a difference um you know by changing some of the way the ways that they do things mm -hmm. i love that i so agree and so powerful uh katie if you're having a bad day things aren't going the way you would like what is the one thing you tell yourself to get yourself back in the groove well i mean i just spend time with my animals and <laughs> i'm not telling myself something but if i'm in a bad mood i have a very silly husky so she always cheers me up <laughs> anna what do you say I take a deep breath and say, this is all temporary. It'll go away, you know? That is probably the most common response <laughs> that people say. And I think it's so true. Just this I, too yeah. shall pass. And I usually yeah. try to take a nap when I really yeah. just feel like, <laughs> just wake up. It'll be different. Oh my gosh. I have two toddlers, so I can't take a nap. So that's why I say this will pass. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you did this interview if you have two toddlers still at home, not yet back at school. Okay, uh, last word from everybody. Anna, you are running around busy like crazy because you're working and you have toddlers. What is your go-to snack? Uh, go-to snack is a good old organic apple. Uh, yeah, can't beat it. Yeah, mm -hmm. an oldie but a goodie. Katie? <laughs> I'm going to go with popcorn with nutritional yeast. With nutritional yeast. Okay, I'll tell you. I used to make popcorn with extra virgin olive oil and nutritional yeast. And then Dr. Gregor told me to switch over to Bragg's. Do you, do you know what Bragg's is? Okay, Bragg's amino acid. And I had never thought about it before. So I put Bragg's amino acid in a spray bottle. And now I spray Bragg's amino acid on it. And then the nutritional yeast sticks to the Bragg's. And, you know, I mean, you got to like the umami flavor, but it's really good. So uh, I leave today's episode on popcorn. And I want to thank both of you for kicking us off in the year 2023, which I say, I know VegTech Invest, we're going big with some big news in about 10 days. We say it's the year to get in climate shape. That might be your portfolio. That might be your cafeteria. That might be your own personal footprint. It just depends. But this is the year when everyone, corporations and individuals alike, this is my prediction, start calculating their own carbon footprint and it, the, the numbers start to have meaning and the impact starts to be real. With that, I leave everyone today. So if you are on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube, I will see you next week. Everybody on iTunes, I love you as well. Anna and Katie, thank you for being with me today. You two don't go away. Everybody else, I'll see you next week. Thank, thank you. you.